Welcome to Joint Effort with Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. This podcast covers the pain and injuries that are associated with muscles, ligaments, and joints. Okay, I'm Baron Bremner, and today on Joint Effort, I'm happy to have Ellen Davis from Davis Sports Nutrition with me. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, I know you're very busy right now. You've got a lot of different jobs going on. We'll touch uh, uh, a lot of different careers, and we'll touch on those a little bit. But uh, my focus today, I want to talk about um, you know optimizing uh, nutrition and health in student athletes, and especially kind of looking at the health of endurance athletes and women endurance athletes, and how to make sure that we don't run into any problems with them nutrition-wise and overtraining and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, that, a, it's an area I'm very passionate about, exactly, so I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about your background, uh, you know, high school and uh, college, and your background in endurance sports. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in high school, I grew up in Iowa. I went to a small high school and was able, very fortunate, to do just about everything. Uh, track, cross country, basketball, softball. I was on the dance team. You know, you name it, yeah. I did it. Um, I found out, you know, pretty early on that running was going to be my future. Track and cross country Mm -hmm. became kind of my focus. Um, Had, you know, just a lot of fun throughout high school and had a really great opportunity to go on to the University of Missouri to run track and cross country Mm -hmm. there. Um, You know, coming from um, small school, you know, getting thrown into the division one environment was a little intimidating for me. I didn't really know what to expect, didn't really know what I was doing. Um, Came to realize that I didn't give a whole lot of thought to nutrition for performance throughout high school because I never really had to. My parents just took care of it for me. Um, I grew up on a farm, you know, we had good hearty meals all the time. It it was what it was, but then um, moving on to college and being left to my own devices and making my own choices, uh, I realized that I hadn't learned anything in regards to nutrition throughout high school. And um, that's where I always say, you know, the wheels kind of started to come off. And if there was a mistake, I made it in did, the way of nutrition. Did they have nutrition. any kind of um, nutrition counseling or coaching on that at that time? Not at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really where my passion for sports nutrition started. I recognized the need for this and it was just starting. That was probably in about 2008 is really when I started to recognize mm-hmm. the correlation between nutrition and performance. And there were sports dietitians popping up at the professional level. Um, I think the Kansas City uh, Royals had a dietitian, um, a few NFL teams had a dietitian, and I thought, oh my gosh, that is so cool, I want to do that. Um, At Mizzou, we did not have anyone at that time. There was a strength coach who was actually a year behind me who was starting her career in dietetics, Mm -hmm. and then she became the sports dietitian at Mizzou actually after I left. And so um, we were kind of trying to piece this all together, um, you know, trying to build a plane as we were flying it, I guess, so (laughs) to speak. And so, um, yeah, I I just realized that the choices I was making and and the timing of my nutrients was just off. Um, And, you know, in retrospect, realized that I was experiencing what we now know as REDS or relative energy deficiency in sport. Um, And so, there's a whole lot of nuances to that. Maybe we can get to that a little bit later. But, um, you know, I was training without a period. Um, I was experiencing bone stress all the time. I think I ended up with five stress fractures over the course of my five years at Mizzou and was just in and out of the training room all the time. And so it was just very frustrating. Yes, I wasn't able to do what I had gone there to do, which was compete, Mm -hmm. you know, because I was always trying to recover. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... You know, Did you know the relationship between um, not having a period and weak bone or osteoporosis at that time and overtraining? No, mm-hmm. no. Um, you know, it was it was a time that you know not having a period was almost like a, a badge of honor. Right. Like it was almost celebrated. Like oh, you're you know you're training hard enough that you know you're not getting a period, and and that was normal and we will we will talk about that um the female athletic triad in a little bit but how did that trigger um you to you know what did you decide about your education goals and how did you make that happen yeah absolutely so um it was total accident i went down to mizzou to become a physical therapist and then um decided that that wasn't probably going to be the the course for me and found dietetics or the nutrition program um by way of personal need and so um 
knew that becoming a dietitian first was what I would needed to do in order to move on to become a sports dietitian. Okay. And so the, the program at Mizzou is, is unique. Um, most programs are um, what's called a coordinated program. Um, I went through a didactic program, um, and so there were 15 students accepted every year to the dietetic program, um, and then you did your internship with your coursework um, all at the same time. Now that's different than most programs where you get your undergraduate and then apply to the internship process afterwards. Mm -hmm. So not totally necessary for this conversation, but just kind of no, pertinent to, to the, the process. So you do your internship program, then you become eligible to sit for a, um, a national exam um, to earn your RD or mm -hmm. registered dietitian credential. Um, and then that's what <laughs> sets you apart as a, as a registered dietitian as opposed to um, just a general nutritionist. Okay. So all dietitians are nutritionists, but not all nutritionists are dietitians. Very is that right? good, yes. And what's LD? You get it. Uh, licensed dietitian. Okay. Yes. Is that just so, a state of Iowa type yep. part and, to it? In the state of Iowa, um, it's required to, to hold your, um, your license if you are um, practicing one-on-one uh, -on -one with, okay. with clients. Okay. Not every state requires that license, um, okay. but in order to be... A registered dietitian. So you, then, in addition to your RD, you got a CSSD. Is yes. That right? Yep. Very Tell good. Us about that. Yeah. So, so the CSSD stands for Certified Specialist in Sports Dietetics, and that just kind of signifies that um, that extra uh, that extra expertise, mm -hmm. I guess, working with um, athletes and active mm -hmm. individuals. So, in order to acquire that, you. Um, required to be a registered dietitian for two years and then have I think it's I think initially it's 2,000 hours working with athletes or active individuals um, and then you sit for another exam um, the CSSD exam mm -hmm. and that is required to be recertified every five years okay. and so um, I sat for that initially in 2016 and then just recertified um, this past spring. Okay. So well, I can officially still say I am still a sports dietitian. <laughs> that's good. That's why I've got you here. Yeah. Um, tell me about your consulting um, for, for sports nutrition. Like um, who do you see and uh, what are your goals with them? Yeah, absolutely. So I work a lot with um, developers developing athletes. So high school, college, and a little bit in the semi-professional world. Mm -hmm. um, been you know really focusing in that area for the last oh now six years um, and I just I knew that there was a need mm -hmm. you know I mentioned as a high school athlete I didn't even know that nutrition was a thing and how that was related to performance and we know so much more now about nutrition and performance and uh, not only nutrition for performance but recovery and injury prevention kind of what we were speaking to earlier and so um, I just wanted to give back. I just know mm -hmm. that I like I with the athletes that I talk with. I, I tell them, you know, I want to help you avoid making the same mistakes that I made. Mm -hmm. um, as a dietitian, that's what we do. We just want to we just want to help people. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it just kind of avoid that heartache. Um, and so, what that looks like um, when consulting with my athletes, I always tell them, you know. Number one, I am not the food police. I am not here to tell you what to eat, what not to eat. That's that's not what this is about. Um, it's more about enhancing what you're already doing mm -hmm. and how can we make those small tweaks um, to fit your personal lifestyle and your goals. Everything we do is very goal oriented, um, and you know we may have a big goal. And we set small goals in process to achieving that mm -hmm. that bigger goal. Would you say that? Um, one of the biggest mistakes is kind of underestimating your caloric needs or how much people are eating in, in these, you know, cross country and track seasons. Yes, absolutely. Um, that is a, my number one um, challenge that, mm -hmm. that I face with my athletes. Um, we live in a world where our high school athletes, you know, for better or for worse, and not, no judgment here, but they are always busy. <laughs> they're all, Definitely. they're filling yeah. their time with whatever, whatever they can, which it, it can be great, except if we're not recognizing the energy needs to support that training and activity, then we're going to fall short. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we live again in a world that has kind of stigmatized calories and, you know, we're always talking about, you know, the next the next diet or, you know, what you shouldn't be doing. 
and marketing goes a long ways. And so, um, you know, my high school athletes really can struggle with that because they, they can't kind of pull out, uh, kind of tease out their needs versus the needs of maybe the general public or, or what people are saying that their right. needs are. Right. And so, um, yeah, we really kind of first sit down and kind of talk about, you know, what are you doing on a daily basis? What are you doing on a weekly basis? What does your mileage look like, for example, for, you know, for a runner? What does, um, you know, for one of my football players or something, like, how much time are you spending in the weight room and, you know, doing drills and skills and then practice on top of that? Um, you know, it's no, it's no accident. It's no surprise that my football players, they work all summer to put on lean muscle mass and then once the season starts they just lose it mm -hmm. you know and that happens all the time and so it's kind of pointing that out and recognizing okay what's what's changing what's changing in your schedule that's like limiting your um, ability to maintain that process and so um, we really kind of focus there and then um, input the meals and, and snacks to like make a, it work. You can kind of do calculations or formulas based on body weight and what you think they need for, you know, what they're taking in and where the deficit is and this is how you're going to make it up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I'll be, you know, I, I practice kind of in a unique way. Um, I don't like to talk a lot about calories and you know macronutrient distribution specifically with my high school athletes That's because good, I don't even know what that is. Okay, okay, good. Um, you know, you know, we're talking about carbohydrate, fat and protein and mm -hmm. you know, I I like to stay away from like that that super specific, you know, um, kind of oh, debilitating structure, mm -hmm. I guess, um, because because of what I've what I've just mentioned, you know, we're we're trying to get away from like that that diet culture or whatever that may be, and so we talk about we talk about energy and the and the energy that food provides, and so um, you know most of the time what I'm finding, especially with with my developing athletes, either high school or college, um, they're at a huge deficit of energy in the first half of the day. We're skipping breakfast. Mm -hmm. We're either not able to have a small meal or a snack at school or in the middle of class because um, schedules just don't allow for it um, or we're not hungry or you know maybe fueling makes you feel sick in the morning whatever it may be mm -hmm. I, there's lots of challenges so a huge deficit the first half of the day That's yes so yep. breakfast is the most important meal of the day it truly not? is yeah it, it is and i know it sounds I'm you know i'm guilty of not ever eating breakfast too it's just it, it happens mood, you know? it, yeah yeah it happens I even I have experienced that and it kind of goes in in phases which is kind of weird um, but what I tell my athletes and it is absolutely true you can train your digestive system to utilize those nutrients just like you train your body and your brain to do your craft whatever that may be and so I recommend start small you know whatever whatever that looks like for you maybe it's maybe it's drinking something in the morning maybe a small mm -hmm. smoothie or even you know a small glass of juice with like some protein powder in it or something mm -hmm. like some combination of that protein and carbohydrate and that's where i try to you know draw the lines like okay that's as far as we go as far <laughs> as like specifics yeah. but just kind of um creating that balance to provide the energy mm -hmm. so what uh, in particular with women's athletics and women's sports what are some uh, unique things that can make that more challenging to treat or you know, social things or psychological things or just physiologic things that can make the women athlete more at risk for malnutrition or poor nutrition? Yeah, um, gosh, so many where, things. Where, where, <laughs> do I, start? Where, do, where do I start here? Um, the culture that we live in is it makes it really difficult for, for young female athletes to find confidence in their actual needs you know and i'll just go you know specifically to let's just say endurance female athletes you know um what is the what is the typical look of an endurance female athlete and 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 that's the problem there is no typical look there should not be a typical look um but that's not what we've been told for so long um and so I think I think social media plays a huge role into the challenge that um, young female athletes face. But I will say the silver lining of this is there is so much more conversation now about how to fuel your body and the benefit of 
having a monthly period and you know there's so much more conversation and I will say you gotta you gotta be looking for it it's not gonna just um, you know fall on your plate on on accident but there are so many dietitians and coaches and trainers who are talking about this Mm -hmm. and becoming more comfortable with that conversation around fueling Mm -hmm. for athletes specifically young female athletes so we were talking earlier about um uh back in the old days you know if you're trained if if you trained really hard you were almost as a badge of honor not to have a period but there's some definite problems with a any woman not having a period because they're overtraining or under eating um can you talk about that the you know the triad of some kind of disordered eating whether it's just not enough or whether it's truly you know an eating disorder like anorexia or bulimia and then um overtraining and losing your period and then how that affects your health Mm -hmm. yeah so super important and it can be lifelong um lasting to the the detriments of it yeah yeah absolutely so so you mentioned the triad so that encompasses um three different areas so um lack of menstrual period um disordered eating or eating disorder and low bone mineral density so those are the three that kind of make up the triad um that disordered eating or eating disorder can be intentional or unintentional that Mm -hmm. that's the big thing with with both the triad and then what i'm going to speak to next with with reds it doesn't have to be something that you are making a choice or purposely intentionally Mm -hmm underfueling you right so right. so that's the hard part it doesn't have to be um a psychological condition exactly that, exactly which is another level of of treatment that might be needed but yes it can just be unintentional just lack of lack of a- to awareness yeah yeah absolutely so so um and they're they're all intertwined right and so um the the lack of the lack of energy availability leads to losing the period which is related to low bone mineral density from losing estrogen yes right? yep okay. yep mm-hmm. um and so so that's what we've been talking about for for many many years has been extensively researched is is the triad now in i think it was um 2000 who i shouldn't should be careful here i think it was 2014 maybe a little bit earlier it was recognized that there were more nuances to the triad than than we originally recognized the sure. the psychological impact the um the immunity impact the cardiometabolic uh, impact that low energy intake was having on both males and females okay right so so the triad obviously was specific to females because it included the lack of menstrual mm-hmm. function now it's important to note <laughs> that females are not the only gender that are suffering from this phenomenon Mm -hmm. right and so so reds or relative energy deficiency in sport kind of encompasses both males and females um and includes a variety of different um metabolic functions Mm -hmm. okay and so um but also includes the lack of menstrual function um disordered eating and low bone mineral Mm -hmm. density Mm -hmm. so it's kind of evolved into oh kind of kind of more messy but Mm -hmm. but explains a lot more you know I've had coaches tell me um I knew this was a thing but I didn't know it had a name you know I've I've right I've experienced this my athletes have been experiencing this for years you know halfway through the season they just look like a different athlete and not for the better (laughs) they're they're not finishing their workouts they're getting hurt they're having prolonged sickness you know and, and I couldn't figure out what it was Um, Well, a lot of it is related to the fact that we're just simply not eating enough or not eating enough of the right type of Mm -hmm. nutrients. Where do you, um, uh, how do you work in conjunction with a family doctor or a a pediatrician with with these student athletes? Yeah, really good question. And so um, I've I've just um, developed, you know, a, a small a small network at this point of um, referring physicians um, that, you know, may or may not specialize in, in sports medicine. Um, my sports med docs recognize it a lot quicker um, and are, are probably more more open to that conversation of, you know, um, 
the involvement of reds and and what that may look like but we just have an open line of um open communication of referral mm -hmm. you know it's just hey um i've got a patient that i think needs help you know is really struggling to meet nutrition needs has been in my clinic you know multiple times with you know chronic stress fractures or you know low iron or mm -hmm. um you know b12 deficiency or whatever that may be mm -hmm. um and then we reach out together or um here he or she provides a referral and mm -hmm. then we just start the conversation about okay um you know how are we doing from a nutrition standpoint yeah. and um oftentimes you know kind of back to that uh intentional or unintentional uh, low energy intake right it's not necessarily an eating disorder but it may be disordered eating but you don't recognize it as it's disordered eating a, com a question i will often ask the athlete you know just very simply what's your relationship like with food right now mm -hmm. how are we how are we feeling there um and that often opens up a big uh a really big and really important conversation um just kind of um yeah exploring that a little mm -hmm. bit um, so in addition to, I, I guess what you'd call just food, is that macro nutrients or is food macronutrients? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in addition to looking at that, their overall intake and, you know, kind of balancing that out, making sure that the energy is sufficient, what are some common, um, I guess, micronutrients or vitamin or mineral deficiencies that you'll see? Yeah, really good question. So um, oftentimes with my... Um, and I don't, I don't want to be specific to my endurance athletes, but... Well, that's, what we're, that's good. That's yeah. what we're talking about yeah. mostly today. So. Most often with my endurance athletes, um, I'll see an iron deficiency mm -hmm. um, or just chronically low iron. And why is iron important? Yeah, iron is important because it um, helps carry oxygen to... Your, your muscles and your cells. Is that important for an endurance athlete to I think have so. oxygen? I think so, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's probably good for your yeah. you know your muscles to be able to breathe and be able to be oxygenated. oxygenated. And so the reason that um, iron is often low in our endurance athletes is because of um, um, foot strike. So every time you, an endurance or a runner or a person mm -hmm. um, hits the ground with their foot, red blood cells are affected. And so the iron is stored in red blood cells. And so you are more often, you are more likely to lose iron just through um, foot strike. I can't remember why I can't, the, the thing, the- Hemolysis or yes, something like that? Yes, yes, okay. yes, thank you. My brain was having oh, a little- um, Interesting. A block, so anyway, so it's that. And then um, we also note that endurance athletes aren't as likely to eat food containing good sources of iron. Like a big S steak or yeah. anything. Any red yeah. meat, um, protein in general. I mean, obviously there are other sources for it. Like Absolutely. my daughter, who's a vegan, who you've talked to, uh, tries to get iron from everywhere. Yep. Uh, that's plant-based. Yep. Um, so an iron, I mean, this stuff that you're talking about, I know we focused a little on female endurance athletes, but of course, male athletes are low in iron too a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. For for that same for those same reasons, mm -hmm. um, so iron is a big one. A um, couple of other uh, nutrients that I look at specifically: um, omega three, fish oil. Mm -hmm. um, where we live here in the Midwest, um, we don't have adequate access to <laughs> sources of food that are are high or good enough in omega three. Um, fatty acids because uh, that comes mostly from fresh salmon tuna um, walnuts some some eggs have a decent amount of omega-3 but it's just not enough mm -hmm. um, and so I'll look at intake of that and then the final one of course being vitamin D which mm -hmm. plays into um, bone density obviously so where we live again a um, little bit too far north to you know, make any vitamin D from the sun's rays mm -hmm from like October through May. And so we're, we're just at a higher risk for vitamin D deficiency. Mm -hmm. So that's often something that I will recommend as a supplement, just okay. almost for everyone. So, okay. So, um, you know, a lot of, do a lot of doctors and, and such don't really recommend doing a lot of supplements and things like that. And that's, there's a deficiency, but yep. if you feel pretty comfortable, even without blood tests that, Iron probably could be supplemented. B B twelve, you said. 
or no, I'm sorry, omega mm-hmm. and vitamin D. Mm-hmm. How about the B vitamins? Do they need to be supplemented in general too or not always? So I would I would want to look more closely at um, daily intake and kind okay. of do an analysis mm-hmm. on, the, on the B vitamins because they're less likely to be okay. deficient, but ultimately best case scenario, you have a, a micronutrient blood panel. And if, you, if you have, well, let's say you have um, somebody who isn't struggling with anything, but they um, want to optimize their nutrition. And, and um, is there a blood test that you should do at that point in time or only if you're worried about something in particular? So that's where it gets a little bit tricky because most, so in order to, um, to get that referral from a physician, you would likely have to be experiencing something that would warrant the referral for for the test, for the micronutrient mm-hmm. test. Um, unless, you know, you've got a really good friend who's a physician who wants <laughs> to do it for you. I don't know. Right. Um, there are options available, but what I what I always recommend is working closely yeah. with your physician and for that. And the nutrition that. panel that they would want to get, that you would want to see, things that you would want to see would be what? For just the screening purposes or if somebody's having problems. Yep. So I would want to see um, iron, uh, B vitamins, um, cal- your all of your um, electrolytes, um, omega-3 if possible. Now that's a different test and there's not a lot of physicians that are you doing that right now. there's an over-counter one, right? There that? is. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Omega Quant makes a omega-3 oh, okay. index testing, which I think it's like $50 or something. Okay. Like very extremely affordable and gives you a lot of information. Um, and then ultimately vitamin D. Okay. Yep. What, what's uh, kind of going back to kind of the basics about um, endurance athletes and optimizing their performance how do you feel like what's some general rules of thought for rest or sleep or naps and uh, hydration whether it's water or something with electrolytes in it yeah really good questions so those um ironically are my my two um my my biggest things that honestly even come before nutrition (laughs) because those are are more realistic to address, especially for my high school and college athletes. It's easier for an athlete to adopt the idea of potentially drinking more water and ensuring that hydration status is met than eating more fruits and vegetables or making time for breakfast in the morning. I can usually get an athlete on board with drinking more water first, which leads to the other stuff, if that makes sense. So um, I always say that hydration is the single easiest, most effective, most economical way to improve your performance, enhance recovery, and reduce your risk of injury, bottom line. Um, and so what I would typically recommend is um, aiming for about half of your body weight in ounces of fluid, whether it's water, milk, juice, smoothie, soup, whatever it may be, every day. Okay, okay so I'll say that again. Half your body weight in ounces of fluid every day. So that's okay. taking your body weight, divide it in half, convert that to ounces, All right. which is more than most people will consume. Mm-hmm. And so then my next my next thing is, okay, if you are nowhere near that goal, please do not start trying to do that, you know, today or tomorrow. Okay. You might float away or you'll spend most of the day in the bathroom, but um, just making small incremental mm-hmm. goals to get, get there is ideal. And then of course, if someone is, um, training multiple hours a day and they're expelling sweat and electrolytes then we work on hydration protocols to ensure that those needs are met long term so okay. there's um yeah some ins and outs it's not you know as overly simplified as, as so, i but, might be making it but no it's good to keep things simple um so typically any kind of fluid is good unless you're losing a ton of sweat in which case you might want to add electrolytes in some form whether it's a sports drink or a tablet or something that you put into the regular water yeah absolutely so usually my recommendation is um, for for anything over for any training stent over an hour um, as part of your recovery you should implement some sort of electrolytes so whether like you said whether that's a sports drink or uh, an electrolyte supplement um, I'd be really careful not to throw out any specifics but there are some that I like I like noon I like liquid IV Um, the right stuff is a really um, is one that contains a lot of sodium. So if you know that you are a, a, a heavy sodium sweater, like you are getting done with your workout and you can, you know, you've got dried salt on your cheek mm-hmm. or, you know, you've got white rings on your, on your t-shirt or whatever, you lose a lot of salt in your sweat. Um, and in that case, 
you need to replenish that. So for most of those people, you know, we, we, we're really down on sodium all the time, but for most of those people, they can salt their food and yes, stuff like that. Yes, yes. And, and see, that goes back to, like, the original conversation where we started. The food yeah. pyramid and yes, stuff like that. Yes, exactly. And so um, so you can you can see where there's some confusion because... Um, well, I can see where your services would be helpful for people, you know, just getting, getting through this. Um, uh, if, so what about rest? I mean, what are the... What are the D1 runners doing? What are the Olympic athletes doing for sleep and naps and stuff like that? Yeah, they are really focusing on sleep, which is, that's kind of, uh, it's, it's been interesting. You know, in the, you know, I don't remember, 60s, 70s, we were really focusing on um, strength training. And then came nutrition. And then I think since nutrition we've really focused on psychology and now we're really focusing on sleep which is so cool because sleep is by far the most important thing for recovery you release the most amount of natural human growth hormone while you're sleeping so you need to sleep in order to be able to recover um, provide that recovery for your cells and your muscles mm -hmm. and so it really kind of depends on your training load, but what I recommend for, for most of my athletes is between eight and 10 hours of sleep per night. Mm -hmm. um, now I know that is very difficult for a lot of developing athletes right now, just because of, again, the world that we live in. So if they're, if they're getting six hours of sleep, we aim for seven. And once we're able to acquire seven, then we aim for eight. Whatever we're able to do to get closer to that overall goal is ideal. Now there's been some um, some really interesting research on naps as well. Um, again, really depends on your schedule. If mm -hmm. you've got that available, if you've got that time available. What if that's your job? You're a pro, a pro runner. What yeah. Are they, what are they doing for naps? Yeah. Um, you know, it. Most of what I am seeing is most at well i shouldn't say most some athletes are really optimizing that by taking about 30 to 60 minute um rest in the middle of the day power, Bet power Bet naps. yep mm -hmm. between their because most uh professional athletes professional runners are training at least twice a day mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. runs mm -hmm. and then you know strength training or yoga or um pilates or something on top of that so taking that taking so, that time yeah. in the middle of the day to i know the kids, rest. Are, kids are having a hard time you know with uh, staying on their phone a little too late getting up too early for school or training before school or student counselor or whatever and, mm -hmm. and then there's really no time after school to take naps but I guess the message would be maximize your sleep yep. however you can do it yep really prioritize you know what is it that's holding you back from going to sleep you know at 9 30 or 10 o'clock which is what we know that we would have to attain in order to get in seven to eight hours up to nine hours before you're getting up to go to school in the next morning. So really be honest with yourself. You know, is it is it really that I'm working on homework until that late or is it because I've dinked around on my phone for 45 oh, yeah. minutes or whatever and kind of prolonged that? I think um, we all are guilty of that. Absolutely, yeah. for sure. I, I, yeah, would agree. Awesome. Um, if somebody wants to, um, you know, talk to you about maybe setting something up. How would they get a hold of you? Or is there an internet internet website or anything like that? Yeah. So um, you can just email me at davissportsnutrition at gmail dot com. Okay. Um, I'm at davissportsnutrition dot com as well. I'll be totally honest with you. We mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation, going a few different directions yeah, right I now. To say that. What is your <laughs> new position? Yeah, so um, my new full-time position was with the state of Iowa, the Iowa Department on Aging, as the health promotion director for the state. And so I've been um, focusing my full-time efforts there and um, really working to kind of cover both ends of the spectrum now. I've, I've worked on developing athletes, and now my full-time job is to enhance the lives of older Iowans. That is perfect. Yeah, so we're getting everything in between. I was I don't know which an one I'm athlete, to. I, I and would I'm like becoming to I'm an older Iowan. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to be needing your services, too. Well, that's great. Um, we really appreciate you coming on the show, and you've had a, a tremendous wealth of information for us. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Joint Effort, a podcast from Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. If you have questions about this podcast and wish to schedule an appointment with a surgeon, call 515-224-1414 or visit dmos.com.